Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Red Raptor Writes. Hopefully, Universal doesn't come after my money this time. Where's my money? Today we're back to review our next dinosaur documentary, 2014's Bigger Than T-Rex. For those who haven't seen it before, this dino doc follows the journey of German paleontologist Dr. Nizar Ibrahim as he searches for more Spinosaurus remains. The end result is the discovery of the Spinosaurus neotype. Well, most of it. The tail will be dug up later. Okay, I'm already getting ahead of myself. Before we dive in, I should point out that this script is being written in the August of 2022. Considering how Spinosaurus is the main subject here, I already know that within a few years, heck, maybe within a few months, some new paper, either from Ibrahim or Hultz, will render this video outdated. Enjoy it for the time being, but remember that science will inevitably march on. Spinosaurus can't go a few years without some dramatic alteration. With that out of the way, let's dig this up. In a major plot twist, the rather obscure Smithsonian movie, Titanoboa Monster Snake took the top of our tier list. Thankfully, Bigger Than T-Rex ripped a page right out of their book by focusing primarily on the paleontology and research side rather than presenting long segments of Spinosaurus life. It's pretty hard to mess up when we're just following paleontologists telling stories about their discoveries. Most of this dino doc covers Dr. Ibrahim's quest to find spino fossils in Morocco. To accomplish this, he follows the trail of private fossil hunters to find where they've been getting the giant remains. It really highlights how aggravating the private fossil trade can be, because these diggers find vast amounts of material that go undocumented, unstudied by actual scientists. So many great specimens fall into private collections, where they become essentially lost to science. Maybe just as important as the specimens themselves is where they came from, from which rocks were they found, where, what was their environment like. These crucial questions are too often left unanswered, leaving paleontologists with loads of confusion even if they can bring these fossils back into the light. So we see this fascinating uphill battle for Ibrahim as he conquers impossible odds. Paul Serrano returns here as pretty much the go-to expert on extinct African animals. This documentary points out his great work on finding a pretty complete Carcharodontosaurus skull, the giant crocodilomorph Sarcosuchus, and another Spinosaurid, Suchomimus. That's just a short list. Him and his team have discovered a shrecking swamp load of new creatures. And we get a lot of history on the early 20th century German paleontologist Erd Stromer, who discovered the original partial Spinosaurus skeleton in 1912 and named it in 1915. During his expeditions, he also uncovered Egyptosaurus, the Carcharodontosaurus holotype, Bahariasaurus, and the movie doesn't mention this, but also Stomatosuchus. Any Spinodoc worth its salt will tell the unfortunate tale of how most of his findings were destroyed in World War II. When the Nazis took over Germany in the 1930s, Stromer was not a fan, of course, rightly so. On April 24, 1944, the Royal British Air Force bombed the city of Munich where his fossils were being held. Stromer requested that his collection be transferred to a safer location but due to his lack of political support, the fossils were left vulnerable where they were ultimately destroyed. And if that wasn't a bad enough loss, two of his sons were killed during the war while another faced capture by the Russians. Ernst Stromer died just a few years later in 1952. A sad example of human history colliding into prehistory. This fascinating story was done justice here. Now, let's talk about the Spinosaurus itself as an animal. The history is easy, I've taught it in several schools already. Now, the real challenge is Spino itself. Many aspects of its biology are still being debated. How it looked, how it hunted, how it swam. We can't even say for certain which specimens are Spinosaurus aegypticus. Should some of them be classified as a separate species, or as separate genre, Ashalaya and Sigilmasasaurus? Then even the sail shape depends on who you ask and when you ask them. Considering that the order of the spines and how long some of the broken ones extended are still unclear. So I'll try my best at devil's advocate. The baits over Spinosaurus are far from settled, so it's important to acknowledge that while there is a singular truth that did exist, we still can't say for certain what that was yet. 
I'll be referencing several scientific studies from a variety of authors. To avoid confusion, here's a timeline of Spinosaurus research from the past decade. One of the biggest ongoing debates is whether it hunted by diving into the water to chase down prey or by wading on the water's edge, snapping up fish. Over the last several years, Dr. Ibrahim has been pushing the subaqueous forager method while Drs. David Hone and Thomas Holtz argued in 2021 that anatomical features of the predator either support or don't directly contradict the shoreline heron method. Meanwhile, certain features directly contradict the pursuit method. Bigger than T-Rex has a spino as a semi-aquatic swimmer, but also a shoreline feeder since footage is repurposed from Planet Dinosaur, which famously showed this off. Whether intentionally or not, National Geographic hit the best of both worlds. I mentioned before how crucial it is to know where fossils came from. A specimen's location can tell us a lot about the species. Thankfully, the movie gets this right. Spinosaurus lived 95 million years ago across North Africa, and maybe South America? They say how Stromer found the holotype in the Egyptian Bahariya formation, and Ibrahim found his neotype in the Moroccan Kem Kem beds, now referred to as the Kem Kem group since it holds two geologic formations. Both Egypt and Morocco consisted of coastal wetland environments carved by rivers and deltas. One feature that makes this North Africa so unique is the strange ratio of predators to prey. So many carnivores lived across this area with not many herbivores to feed them at all. You ain't yours. This is mine. You took my only food. Now I'm gonna starve. This resulted in niche partitioning. Rather than everyone eating the handful of sauropods, Spinosaurus took advantage of the large fish, allowing for it to thrive and avoid competition with the equally terrifying Carcharodontosaurus. Bigger Than T-Rex does a great job showing off the unique adaptations that suited Spino for Piscivorous life by the water, rather than the terrestrial sauropod hunting of its contemporaries. Spinosaurids shared analogous traits with crocodilians, meaning that they didn't come from a common ancestor, but appeared separately in both lineages. These adaptations include elongated jaws, filled with conical teeth perfect for catching slippery prey, sensory pits to help them detect movement in water, a propelling tail that we'll discuss more later, and flat feet for paddling and walking across muddy substrate. Their relative's name, Suchomimus, literally means crocodile mimic. Actually, the Suchomimus is portrayed just as well here. They sported much shorter sails and lived 15 million years earlier in Niger. They are oversized at 12 meters, when even the highest estimates only place them at 11 meters, but the type specimen we have is probably a subadult, so they could have grown larger. Anyway, we don't see much of Spinosaurus life itself, but what little we do see is right on point. Man, this was an embarrassing time in paleontology. Really? A quadrupedal Spinosaurus? Really, 2014 Ibrahim? Really? No theropod has ever been found to move quadrupedally. The earliest dinosaurs were bipeds, and they stuck to this body plan. That's not to say for certain that no theropod ever adopted this form of locomotion. Who knows what we're gonna find? But it would have been pretty random considering how we already had other Spinosaurids that were fairly complete, like Baryonyx and Zucomimus. Again, thank you Giga Chad Sereno. Even as a snotty high schooler in 2014, the knuckle walking quadruped seemed dumb. Their forelimbs would not have been used for weight bearing. That idea is just the worst. More recent studies have only confirmed my obvious suspicions. Dr. Donald Henderson in 2018 rigorously crafted a computer model to test the buoyancy and center of mass on the animal. What he found was that the center of mass on Spinosaurus sat right in front of their hind limbs, similar to the other bipedal dinosaurs. And still, that was before the tail got even bigger. Dr. Henderson concluded that Spino was perfectly capable of walking on two legs. He also argued how they couldn't submerge themselves, being too buoyant, so they'd just float along the surface. This puts a huge dent in the subaqueous forager idea. You can't catch fish if you can't go underwater. 
In all fairness, this floating problem has been contradicted by a recent paper back in March, co-authored by several experts including Ibrahim, in which the bone densities of spinosaurids are compared to other creatures. There is a trend in which more aquatic animals have denser bones for greater buoyancy control. Spinosaurs and baryonyx follow this trend with relatively more dense bones pointing to a lifestyle in water. But surprisingly enough, Suchomimus came out as more hollow, more adapted to terrestrial life. So maybe Spino could dive after all? Along with global catastrophe, 2020 saw the reveal of the fish eater's tail, being found at the same place as the neotype. It likely belongs to the same individual. With tall caudal vertebrae and elongated chevrons on the underside, a paddle shape was made, useful for propelling Spino through the water. This kind of function is seen in animals today like crocodiles and newts. Ibrahim and his colleagues found that this tail shape would have produced eight times the amount of thrust as that of the other theropods, Coelophysis and Allosaurus. Though Spinosaurus' tail wouldn't have been as efficient as Crocs and Newts, it was a major step in the right direction. But as usual with this genus, more answers bring more questions. Famed paleoartist Dr. Mark Witten questioned whether their tails were flexible and powerful enough to propel the 7-ton hunter through the water in this way. Could the tail bend back and forth in the speculated paddle motion? Maybe its functionality was more for display like a sailfin lizard. Whatever the case, Bigger Than T-Rex came out 6 years before its description, so I'd love to see a more up-to-date documentary with Spinosaurus. The last potentially outdated bit is the brief inclusion of the Egyptian carnivore Bahariosaurus. Now, not much is known about this genus. The bits and pieces Stromer did have were also destroyed by the allies. However, it has been tossed around as a Carcharodontosaurid, a Megaraptorin, and maybe a Noasaurid. But besides that, Bahariosaurus is sometimes synonymized with Delta Dromius, another carnivore found in the Chemchem group. Material on both creatures, or singular creature if you consider them synonyms, is fragmentary, so we might have to wait on a definitive answer. Even if Bigger Than T-Rex is another example of a based, expert-led documentary that cares about actual paleontology, it isn't without its own hiccups. As we've seen before, none of these programs are perfect. The most obvious flaw is, well, it's in the title. Tyrannosaurus on average may not have been the longest theropod dinosaur, it was edged out by Spino, Karkar, and the Giga, but it was still the most massive. AKA the biggest, AKA the largest. The size of a barge. Usual estimates from Gregory S. Paul and Nizar Ibrahim place Spinosaurus at around 50 feet or 15 meters compared to the usual 40 foot T Rex. But the catch is the Rex can approach 9 metric tons in weight as opposed to the over 7 ton Spino. So no, Spinosaurus is not bigger than T-Rex. In fact, I'm sick of this cliche. All too often, when there's some new theropod discovery, media outlets immediately feel the godforsaken need to make comparisons to Tyrannosaurus. Can't a carnivorous dinosaur exist on its own, be fascinating in its own right? Paleontology isn't some group like the plastics where theropods are only popular by proxy to T-Rex. Regarding the March 2022 paper on spino bone density, CNN posted this article. A dinosaur bigger than T-Rex swam and hunted its prey underwater. After the Carcharodontosaurid Ulegbegsaurus was described, this Newsweek article had to advertise it as bigger than T-Rex ancestor. That ancestor in question was Timurlangia, a much smaller 13-foot Tyrannosauroid. At least that article had the sense to include the ancestor part, unlike People.com that literally calls Ulegbegsaurus five times larger than Tyrannosaurus itself. I am going to Kermit suicide. <laughs> This insane level of clickbaiting needs to end. Stop abusing the king's name. Alright, that was a rant that's been burning in my mind, but this dino doc doesn't stop there. Spinosaurus is hailed as the biggest dinosaur, period. No qualifiers, no caveats, it's just the biggest. Biggest theropod now, at least I understand the confusion. Biggest dinosaur though? Did we forget about the many, many sauropods that dwarfed it? 
Another bad take is that, once again, birds are described as relatives of theropod dinosaurs. Even some of the better dinosaur content makes this glaring mistake. No, birds aren't relatives of this clade. Birds are theropod dinosaurs. That would be like if you were called a relative of humans. It might be a funny insult, but it's scientifically inaccurate. Birds are modern theropods and, as such, are often used as modern analogs to make inferences from. Crocodilians also fill that role as distantly related archosaurs, but in an equally terrible fashion, the narrator makes this claim. Crocodilians, which branched off from dinosaurs about 200 million years ago. This. This makes not even the most minuscule amount of sense. Both come from the group of reptiles Archosauria, the lineage that gave rise to modern crocodilians, Pseudosuchians, and that of birds, Ava Metatarsalia, split much sooner in the early Triassic about 250 million years ago. The 200 million years claimed in this film was during the early Jurassic, when dinosaurs were already well established and on their way to global domination. To be or not to be. Yorick, I'll be back with weapons. As you viewers at home can tell, there is still a lot of uncertainty when it comes to Spinosaurus. At this point, the first thing you need to know is that you don't know. Hopefully with more finds and more research, our perception of this ancient beast will grow clearer. As for bigger than T-Vex, uh, this is a tough one. For its time, this documentary was mostly accurate. There's still a lot that holds up today, but a lot that doesn't. To make matters stranger, I think it's overall more accurate than Planet Dinosaur, but I like the former Spinosaurus more if that makes sense. With all things considered, I find it fair to give Bigger Than T-Vex a high B. Overall, this was a good dinosaur documentary, based partially on a dumb theory, with some goofs along the way. So, this is the right move in my opinion. Because I talked so much about Spinosaurus here, for goodness sake, it can take up a whole episode, I'll hold back when I see it again in Amazing Dino World, but that won't be for a while. I know I've been talking in circles for this entire episode, but I hope you got something out of it. Remember, if you enjoyed this episode, to please leave a like, subscribe, and check out my social media. See you next time.